I've been coding for about five years now. And in that time, I've learned a ton of technology, had a bunch of different jobs, and I've gotten to what I would consider a successful point in my career. So I wanna use this video to kind of lay out the roadmap of how I got here, what technologies I learned, and what major resources I used to land where I am today. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't the end all be all of how you get into tech. This is just what worked for me. Like, I enjoy reading books and watching YouTube videos to on-ramp onto things. You might be somebody who needs articles or pair programming or whatever. And that's just fine. What works for you works for you. This is sort of just the landscape of things that I found extremely impactful throughout the years and how I landed where I am today. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. 2017, I'm super burned out. I was doing nursing at the time. And if you had watched my transition from nursing into computer science video, then you know the whole journey. Long story short, I just wanted a better career. So no, I wasn't a high school kid coding. I was a brand spanking new to coding, getting started, wanting to transition to career type person, which I think a lot of you people are. It's a good career to be in and there's lots of opportunities and good money to be made. So it's not surprising to me that a lot of people are making this transition. At the time, I definitely wanted to figure out if coding was for me and if I would actually enjoy the day to day. So one of the first things that I did was I went over to freecodecamp.org. This place is mm, so good. This was my first introduction to algorithms and data structures and building websites and building backends and database design and all this stuff. This is where I had major introductions to all of these topics. So if you're thinking about getting into coding, if you're just not sure if it's for you, if you wanna get your feet a little wet, Free Code Camp is awesome. The barrier to entry is extremely low. It's free. So you really don't have an excuse not to try this. My hair looks like it's on fire right now. <laughs> I also had one of my friends recommend this course. This is Harvard's CS50 class. It's basically their freshman intro to computer science class. I went through the whole thing and it also has a great introduction to all kinds of topics. C, JavaScript, you do a little bit of Python, big introductions to algorithms and data structures. This is like the foundational computer science class. And I really recommend it to anyone, even people who are in the field and don't have a great computer science background. This gives you a really, really good foundation. So I remember after doing a bunch of free code camp doing this, and again, I was still working as a nurse. So doing this on my free time, still working, all that stuff. And I was getting really, really excited. So I started learning more about JavaScript, doing more of the free code camp stuff. And I ended up coming over to YouTube land where I found just a plethora of really, really good content for learning new web development stuff. I think I ended up watching, oh man, these are all way too new for me. I remember watching this one, learn JavaScript in 12 minutes, <laughs> thinking it was awesome. But somewhere in here in the depths of YouTube, I ended up learning React and front end web development. And I made a few silly little projects and was kind of figuring out what I was doing. And I basically got to a point, and I think most people get to this point, where I had a decision to make. It was either self-taught, boot camp, or go back to school. And those were really the three options at the time in 2017 that I felt like were the only viable ways to get into the field. I ended up going with computer science degree at Oregon State University, which I was able to do completely online for, you know, basically two, three years. And somewhere down here, I actually ended up doing this post baccalaureate program, which is only 60 credits and basically takes credits from your other degree, my nursing degree, and applies them to this degree. So you're not having to redo freshman English and math 101 and stuff. A lot of people have asked me why I chose to do this computer science degree and not a boot camp, which really would have only taken six months or even self-taught. And really in the end, at the time in 2017, I felt like the computer science degree is what really would have set me up for the best career in the long term that I could have possibly had. But don't get me wrong, things have changed a little bit. 2021 has been a little weird for tech, I think. There's been an insane amount of job opportunities. And really, I think this is the best time for anyone to get into tech probably ever, probably since the dot-com bubble. The number of engineering product design jobs is just 
innumerable. It's insane. Companies need these people. So if you're looking to get into tech, I would still consider a bootcamp maybe. Even the self-taught route can be really good. You know, there's whole videos out there about should you do bootcamp or not. What was best for me at the time was a degree program. I felt like it gave me the best foundational uh, sort of way to get into tech and have a computer science background, which I ended up really, really enjoying. So 2018 was kind of split up into two giant chunks. First, in 2018, I was basically going really hard at school. I had quit my quote unquote day job, so I was pretty much just doing school. And then in the summer of 2018, I picked up an internship and was doing that down in Colorado Springs at a nonprofit. And that was also a really, really awesome experience. So first, let's dive into some of the stuff at school I was doing. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna dive into all of the curriculum. It was, it was a computer science curriculum. It was pretty typical. But I do wanna go over some of the technologies and books I read and things that really impacted me and still sit with me today. One of the biggest ones I'll mention is the Mythical Man Month. The Mythical Man Month is just a classic, classic, classic book basically about computer software development practices and methodologies and the people behind it. You know, when you're in school and stuff, it's so easy to just get so sucked into your own brain where you're just thinking about what you're doing, what you're coding, what you're working on. The Mythical Man Month really breaks down how, as part of teams and organizations, those things break down really, really quickly. And just to give you a sneak peek, the Mythical Man Month is one of the articles in here that he wrote about how when you add people to teams, it really actually makes your productivity worse. And there's this mythical person who's like, oh, we're gonna add people to the team and we're gonna be that much more productive because we added headcount. No, you now just have, you know, made more communication problems because you have another person on the team to communicate with and to keep in sync with. So it's stuff like that in this book. Really good, not a very long read, but mm, really, really recommended. Oh, and that was for a class I did that was more the philosophy of software engineers and organizations and teams, not so much actually building software and computer science, but the kind of philosophy methodologies and stuff. Really good class, enjoyed that a lot. Uh, I did a ton of C programming in school, which was a huge pain in my ass. So I remember this book being really helpful. It's just called The C Programming Language. This, this is all gonna be backwards, but you get the point. The C Programming Language, this book was also very short. The C Programming Language is not that complicated. It doesn't have a ton of interfaces in it, but really good book. And it's from the creators of C, I believe. And I might be wrong about that, but regardless, it's really insightful, gives you a really good idea of just like the underlying stuff that's happening in memory, in processes when you're writing C code, and actually gives you a really good picture of what's happening in a computer and how a computer slurps up code, turns it into some bytes, and then boom, it's doing a thing. So yeah, most of my program in school was in C, which, you know, again, huge pain in my ass, but I do believe that most programmers should learn a little bit of C, just so you can wrap your head around what's happening underneath all of the gobbledygook and how your code actually turns into something that you see on a web page or see in an application. It really gives you a good picture of kind of the full stack. And speaking of the full stack, this book was awesome. It's just Code. Uh, code was awesome by Charles Petzold. Uh, really, really good book. This one is also kind of just about the whole stack and the hidden way that uh, computer hardware and computer languages get turned into stuff we used. And this one, this one is deep. This one starts at like, okay, what is a byte? What is binary? How, what is, you know, hex blah, blah, blah and stuff. And I mean, I think really the first, really the first half of the book, I mean, goodness, look at this. The first, halfway through the book, they're still talking about logic gates and operators. So if you want a really deep dive on just how the hell a computer actually works, code. This one's a great book. So yeah, a lot of low level stuff. I mean, you do get that in a computer science degree. I really enjoyed it, but again, not really for everyone in the end. Uh, this book kind of brings a lot of that more high level and gets into some of the algorithms and data structure stuff. This is grokking algorithms. And this is a illustrated guide for programmers and other curious people and goes through at a very high level, just kind of what's happening, not only in a computer, but with these big high level algorithms like Dijkstra's algorithm and sorting algorithms and search algorithms and stuff. This one's really good, especially as a primer to starting to interview for software engineering jobs. 
Mm, this is a really good one. I really enjoy this book. I've even had friends read this one because they're like, well, what the hell do you do day to day? And I'm like, well, you want to learn a little bit about algorithms and data structures and stuff and kind of like the actual science behind what I'm doing. This book, this book's really good. There was another one, this one, Intro to Algorithms. This one is like, oh boy, this is like every computer science student's bane. This is essentially a textbook and it's it's definitely a textbook. It's not one that you can just sit down and read and I don't have it anymore because I think I like just got rid of it and sold it for like a hundred bucks or whatever because I was just like done with it. <laughs> But it's a really great book. This one is like the Bible. This is the Bible of algorithms and data structures. I needed this book for three classes in my computer science degree. And it's 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 thick. You know, it uses mathematical notation, so it's not actually using a programming language. It's talking about these algorithms and stuff and how you would actually approach it from a mathematical perspective. And yet it's stood the test of time because it's that freaking good. I mean, if you are just even curious about some of this algorithms data structure stuff and want to maybe get your mind into some of the computer sciencey things that you didn't get in a degree if you did a boot camp or something this book if there was one book i recommended that you should on ramp a bit to computer science as a science and as a study it's this one intro to algorithms this one is like the classic book for computer scientists but yeah i got rid of it because i was just i was i was over it i was so done <laughs> Maybe I'll get another one. I mean, they're not that expensive. I can get a used one for 43 bucks. $43 for all of computer science knowledge. Mm, good. This is another one of those. Oh, this is this is a thick boy. This is a thick boy. This is the Linux programming interface. Uh, this one was one of my textbooks for my operating systems class. And like I, I took a, a networking class and a parallel programming class. This was a textbook for all of them. Uh, this book is really good uh i think it's all written in c uh which again huge pain in my ass but uh this book is like the bible of operating system and linux interface programming it's like if you wanted to learn about how the hell docker works this book if you wanted to know about the underlying way that bash or z shell works this book this is all of the like deep deep guts of Linux and how it works and how you can plug into it with programming languages. But yeah, thick, thick boy. This one, yeah, I almost didn't include this because, you know, it's so big and thick and hard to get through, but uh, it's really, it's a good book. And it's really, you know, got some really good and interesting tidbits in here. I actually met this guy. I met him because of a work thing. Fascinating individual, just absolutely fascinating. They maintain the man7.org stuff, which if you don't know, is like basically all the manual pages on Linux. And I mean, just like a hero of computer science. They wrote this whole gosh dang thing. Mm, crazy. All right, moving right along. Finally, one of the last books that I definitely would have recommended from this year is Cracking the Coding Interview. Oh, look at that. It's basically gone on my green screen. Again, a classic. Everybody knows about this book. Everybody knows about Cracking the Coding Interview. This is basically the Bible for programming interviews, programming technical interviews. If you're going to get asked a technical question, you better have had this on your shelf and read through some of the problems and stuff because this really, really is like the Bible of programming technical interviews. Okay very exciting all of these books and textbooks and stuff that's just kind of my general recommendations and what i remember being really impactful for me i still have a lot of these books and have cracked them open from time to time just to refresh and because i'm a dork uh, a couple other ones i remember being really good uh these uh bees bidges oh i do not know how to say that the guide to network programming using internet sockets again this is another book basically in c but it basically demystifies everything about networking and network programming all in Linux, all with C and how the hell all this stuff works. You basically re-implement TCP, you implement sockets, you implement basically the internet stack in this book. It's crazy, it's thick, it's good. And they've done a number of these other ones. I remember this one being a prerequisite for some of my operating systems classes. This one was interesting, very similar to the programming Linux interfaces one. Uh, the guide to C programming was really, really good. I think I gave this one a cursory look. Still an alpha? 
they probably haven't touched this one in years. But still, like all this stuff, and there's other ones too. There's one for Python that this person has done. That's really good. And these are like really high quality things. I also remember at the time getting like really into the command line and Linux stuff. And as you can obviously tell, I'm just like a Linux dork at this point. I read through that whole friggin' textbook about Linux programming interfaces. So I remember going through this repo, but TLDR, this is kind of the like big meta like things that you could learn about the command line and getting just really really good on the command line this is the art of command line and I mean, as you can tell it has almost a hundred thousand stars on github really good if you want to get really really good at command line stuff so while I was doing school, one major project that I had that was a total side project was this Slack bot, which is essentially a bot on the unofficial Slack space that the school had. Basically it was a bunch of students that got together and made this Slack space. And it was basically an auto moderator, kind of like what Discord does with a lot of auto moderation stuff or a lot of Reddit subreddits have auto moderation. I implemented a bunch of this in JavaScript nonetheless, mostly because it was easy to plug into the Slack APIs and blah, 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 all this good stuff. TLDR, I had a major side project that I could put on a resume and this, this actually helped me get my internship in 2018. And I think was actually majorly impactful in saying, hey, I created a service that did a thing for hundreds and hundreds of people on another service on Slack. And that's a big deal. I bring this up because I think that having a major side project can actually be really impactful, especially when you're in school, in a boot camp, when you're learning, to put on a resume and say, I did this thing, look at it, it's so good. I hire me. So that essentially brings me to the next thing that happened in 2018 that was really big and impactful was my computer science internship. I took a software engineering internship at a nonprofit in Colorado Springs and I was doing a bunch of JavaScript. I mean, probably because they saw my other uh, project in JavaScript and they said, oh, this guy knows JavaScript. Let's put him on the JavaScript team. And it actually ended up being a lot of Node.js, which I was not familiar with. I hadn't used. I obviously I had done a bunch of this stuff in C in the back end, creating like C servers and stuff in the back end for my networking class and operating systems class and stuff. So moving to Node.js was actually a like huge, huge breath of fresh air. It was really nice learning and uh, I kind of just learned it on the job, if I remember. Um, those were kind of rough days, I'm not gonna lie. They were like kind of just thrown into the pit of you know, like, do this thing, you are now on this team and you gotta learn some stuff. Uh, but really, really good experience. Any professional experience you can get at all, be it at some nonprofit or the hospital you work at or something, or if you're an accountant and you can automate some stuff, that's professional experience. You can put that on a resume and that looks good when you're looking for other jobs at FANGs or you know major software companies or something. At the end of 2018, I graduated school and around the same time I was interviewing for jobs, again, cracking the coding interview, that was basically my life. And I yeah, was doing all these interviews and I got a really good offer and it was at a place I was really excited to work. So I took the job and thus began my 2019. I started that job at the beginning of 2019. Had a nice long holiday break. Take a break after school and stuff if you can. That was really nice. I did a bunch of skiing and stuff. Mm, it was really good. So that job was primarily in and around Cloud Foundry, which you know is kind of a defunct technology these days, but was really cool getting to work in and start doing open source like right away. Open source is something that I've become really passionate about and you know was always really, really interesting when I was school. So it was, I was really lucky, I'll say that much. I was extremely, extremely lucky to basically get the job I wanted right out of school. People have asked me before, like, oh, how John, how, how in the heck do you find a job? Like, what did you get a reference or whatever? And again, I got really lucky. I mean, you're gonna be looking on, you're gonna be looking on LinkedIn jobs. You're gonna be looking on, I mean, Indeed has jobs and stuff. You're gonna be all over the place, just looking for jobs. Just apply for those. Yeah, so it shouldn't be a mystery like where you can find jobs. And maybe it's different in different countries, but in the States, 
there's so many places to look for jobs and find jobs. And especially now in 2021, again, this is probably the best time you could be looking for a job. So just find some jobs, write an application, send it out. You're probably gonna send away 500 applications and get callbacks on you know 20 or something and then get one offer. And that's fine, that's how it goes. I mean, it's sort of a gambling game at points. But having a reference is always really, really good. If you can have a reference into the company that you want to apply for and work for, write cover letters, that's always good. I wrote a cover letter for every single job I applied for and I got a fair number of interviews, I would say. If you want a job, do what you need to do to get a job. That's that's basically all I'm saying is it, it, it's not gonna come to you. You must manifest it out of what you're doing, which means you have to write the resume. You have to write the cover letter. You have to go find the job postings on all these sites and apply to them. So yeah, that's kind of my spiel on finding a job and how I got the job, which is hard. It's hard out of school. You know, you got a lot of stuff that you've just learned and now they're expecting you to, you know, read freaking technical interview manuals just so that you can apply. It's hard, don't get me wrong, but do what you gotta do, study, write good resumes, and you'll be fine. Okay, so I was doing a lot of Go uh, on Cloud Foundry and stuff, and Go is a sort of newish language, maybe not so much anymore, uh, but at the time in 2018, 2019, it felt pretty new to me. I didn't know anybody who was using it. I didn't learn it in school. I got hired at this job, and I was kind of like, oh, I don't know a damn thing about this, so here we go. <laughs> Go puns are always great. So there's a lot of good Go resources out in the wild. Uh, this is a tour of Go, which is like an interactive development environment tutorial thing. Mm, very, very good. Go by example was really, really good. I actually went through this whole thing like the day before I interviewed because they basically interviewed me in Go and I was like, well, I don't know Go, so I might as well just <laughs> cram for the language. Yeah, but Go by example is really good. Uh, I've also used this site a lot for just learning random things. Like if you need Go, uh, scroll back up. Here's Go in a bunch of different languages. And it's basically just one single Go program that basically talks about every single aspect of the language. And I mean, this, this file can't be more than, you know, 500 lines or something. So you go through this whole thing and you pretty much have a very very brief overview of what the language is and I've, I've gone here before just to be like oh how do i do a map again uh it's oh right there oh map right there easy okay so this site can be a really good reference just to like quick search for things i also read this book which is the go programming language and funny enough it's very similar to the c programming language and one of the authors is the same author so about the same length and just as good quality this book is really really good goes through the entire language everything you need to know good practices really really good book so yeah 2019 was a very very full year just learning a ton of stuff and thankfully it was all on the job kind of once you get your first programming job you're really going to be just drinking from the hose i was doing a lot with command line stuff so i remember diving back into a lot of command line resources that i had picked up throughout school. I remember finding this really, really useful. This is the missing semester of your CS education. And it basically goes through a bunch of stuff that's like really good to know about, especially in the industry, like Git, for example, that everybody uses or Vim or shell tools or you know common things that are just like really good to know on the command line. Uh, and I remember applying this very, very heavily to my job at the time. This was extremely, extremely worth it. All right, that basically brings us to 2020, which I'm not gonna talk a ton about because I was like really in depth leading a team on a very specific project area. I was still doing a ton of Go, a lot of the command line stuff, uh, but it was kind of deep into two product areas, primarily Grafana and Prometheus. Both of these are major open source projects. And the company that I was working with wanted to basically ship kind of our own iterations of these, both of them in the observability space. And if you don't know much about observability, it's basically how you can look at what your apps are doing in the back end or the front end and see quote unquote how healthy they are. A good example of this is the GitHub status page. Here's basically all the things that GitHub is seeing with their systems and their things. There was actually an incident yesterday, which 
was kind of a huge pain in the neck for what we were doing at work. Uh, but you know, that stuff happens. And you know, it's good to be able to look into what these things are doing. And that's essentially the product area I was in. So it was really in depth into those things, which is definitely very industry specific, uh, but it was good. I think, you know, at that point in my career, I'd been working one or two years professionally, and I really had gained a lot of subject uh, subject area expertise that I was able to lead a team and apply those skills. And I think one or two years being heavy into the industry is a good time to start thinking about leading a team and thinking about applying your area expertise to uh, a specific team. That's not only when you can really start doing fulfilling work, creating interesting solutions that you know you and your expert brain have come up with. You can also make lots of money doing these expert area matters. But TLDR 2020 really ended up being kind of a deep dive into observability for me. 2020 is also when I started making content, tech content, and that has been really fulfilling in its own way as I've been able to share my interests and expertise with the community and the world and I've gotten really good feedback from people and it's been really fun and really enjoyed that. So in 2021, I actually shifted paths a little bit and joined a team doing Kubernetes and actually contributing to upstream Kubernetes and creating our own Kubernetes solutions and deployments and stuff which meant having to on-ramp to a bunch of other new technologies, to me at least. And you know, that's kind of the cycle. If there's one thing you take away from this video is you're never done learning in this career. You're never, ever, ever done learning in this career. And for me, that's great. I love it. I love just slurping up knowledge like a sponge. So primarily working in Kubernetes meant two things. Thankfully still in Go, so I didn't have to become a subject area expert in a different programming language, but it meant two big things, which was Docker, which is how you containerize your applications and things, and also Kubernetes itself, which is not only a ginormous code base and ecosystem of things and products, but also its own deployment methodologies and ways that you do things. So for Docker one, here's their their website, their documentation is really, really good. Here's their doc site. It's just really, really good. They've done a really good job of explaining how you get things, how you do things, how you create containers and stuff. And in the end, it's really a tool set and their documentation for their tool set is really good. One thing that I've definitely noticed throughout my journey is that I am a lot more likely to go to the actual documentation these days than I am to go to a dedicated book or course or YouTube course or something. I've gotten much better at Googling things and looking up things in documentation. And some of that, really all of that is really just experience and being able to say, hmm, I've seen this in other places similarly, so it must be in this place with this new thing that I'm trying to learn, right? You know, most programming languages are pretty similar in the end. They all basically have variables. They all basically have some kind of array thing, right? So you get much better at learning things faster with maybe fewer resources or just kind of by reference from things that you already know, which is awesome about getting experience and getting better and better in your career. So yeah, Docker has pretty, <clears throat> so yeah, Docker has really good documentation, learned a bunch of that. And then I also remember doing this, the dockercurriculum.com, which was just a bunch of stuff about Docker and like best practices and stuff that you can kind of do in like a real world environment. And what makes Docker really great is that it is deployable to your desktop, basically to your laptop. You don't have to deploy it to the cloud and expend resources or something. You can just do it locally, uh, which is really, really nice. And unfortunately, you can't always say that for all these tool sets. Some tool sets like Terraform or something, you really have to use it against a cloud to be able to see it actually doing its thing and working, which can make development cycles a little bit longer. So yeah, learning Docker was definitely a joy. There's a reason people love it. It's great. Although there's definitely been a lot of spicy stuff happening with Docker. I think Docker desktop is no more. I think you have to pay for Docker desktop now, which is a big sad. The second really biggest thing that I had to learn was Kubernetes and not just the Kubernetes way of coding and doing things with Go and all that, but the actual like Kubernetes way of deploying and creating environments and provisioning virtual machines and deploying to the cloud. Like Kubernetes is a whole thing. Like people spend their basically entire careers 
just learning infrastructure stuff like this and learning how to deploy. Thankfully, the Kubernetes documentation is also really good. Like it's very up to date. It has just a ton of stuff. I mean, if I want to try Kubernetes right now, like, oh, here we go, view tutorials. Uh, it's organized very well. Uh, but I do think that Kubernetes itself definitely warrants going through one of these. Like it's a whole system of just craziness and stuff. And there's like an endless plethora of Kubernetes technology videos. Like there's Linus, look at him. Even Linus has talked about Kubernetes. It's that crazy popular. One of the biggest resources I remember helping me just understand what the hell was going on was this Kubernetes the hard way, which is kind of a meme in the Kubernetes community itself anyways these days. Uh, but it's really good. Basically what it does is it takes you from nothing and it has you deploy Kubernetes to the Google Cloud and you know you can do it by basically free. I think as far as they wrote this, it's free to do it. Uh, but what it does is you're basically gonna deploy all these components, TLDR, Kubernetes is made up of a bunch of smaller different components, and then boom, it's up in the cloud, you can use it, you can try it, and you've just seen the end-to-end -end experience of actually creating a cluster, provisioning the machines, and doing that all yourself. So, bleh, oof, <laughs> that basically brings us to today. That's what I'm working on, that's what I'm doing. And uh, I hope this kind of picture of a journey was interesting to you and shows you how I went from basically knowing nothing, zero, to learning some JavaScript, learning some stuff about just how the hell computers work, the command line, learning Go, getting a job, and creating projects, and now being a major area expert and creating products for big companies to do stuff. And you know that's not to flaunt what I'm doing, that's just to show you that you can do it too, that you can get to a place in your career where you're creating stuff and yeah, it's possible, it happens. You know, I didn't start coding seriously, I would say, until I was 22, 23 maybe or something. And even then I was still like, should I go to school? Like, what, I, what am I doing? It's possible, you can do it, you can get there, yeah. Anyways, I hope everybody enjoyed this video. Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe for more of this kind of stuff. And let me know your thoughts and if you have any questions about stuff I talked about in this video, I'd love to chat with you in the comments. I will catch you guys next time. Peace.